All right, try to use a microphone because we're, we're live on the internet, so that way people will be able to hear your questions. And we got about a half hour, so you know, we'll, we'll field anything you got. It, it was a great talk by both of you. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the question, questions I had was about uh, the kind of atmosphere we have uh, these days, right? So the discussions are, of course, I mean, if you meet in this kind of communities, you're having discussions about innovation and data and all of that. But otherwise, the discussion, the mood of the country has changed from, uh, you understand, right? It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of false news, there's a lot of false propaganda, there's a lot of hatred. And that's, that's, I, I think it's affecting uh, the kind of economy we are living in, the kind of country we are living in. So how, how, how do you think we should uh, counter it and how, how should we uh, go forward? I mean, if, if you were to advise, not just, not just at this level, at our level, at even the higher levels, what would your advice be? First of all, I am biased. So let's start with that. I am biased with the idea of India that our founding fathers had. So my approach to this would be first focus on building inclusive India. Inclusive India does not necessarily mean just Hindu, Muslim, women, tribals. Everybody has to have a stake in India. And at times, being a majority, I must overdo something for minority. It is like having a handicapped child in the house. Other people would feel jealous that you are giving too much importance to handicap. But that's what you have to do. This is your family. You cannot ignore a part of your family. So I would focus on inclusion. I would then focus on new technologies today with new possibilities in the future as the core of my thinking and not worry about past. I am not interested in drivers or jobs for the drivers anymore. I'm interested in driverless car and its impact on India. I don't want to look at old jobs. That doesn't mean I'm going to ignore old jobs. But I want to look at new jobs of tomorrow. I want to make sure that 650 million people below age of 25 have a dream. Their dream cannot be based on what all these politicians are saying. They have no clue. Okay. But these young people have been sucked into their narrative. You need new narrative. New narrative has to be that look, everything we are doing is obsolete. We want to create new India with new tools, new technology, new future. Like he said, why with all the food in India, 200 million people are hungry. Why our children don't have enough nutrition? Are we using technology to take that food to the right people? Seven years ago, I started food bank in India. Just one guy. I don't have money like other rich people have. Took me seven years to get 10 food banks in India. Okay. Every district should have a food bank. Every district should take responsibility to feed their hungry. Forget about government. It is not government's job. Government is not equipped. So as we begin to decentralize, as we begin to use this new instrument, we are basically empowering every human being. You could be teacher, you could be doctor, you could be lawyer, and you don't need to follow all the government norms. And you could be helping other people besides making your own living. This world has created a model where greed is the most important thing. I have discussion with my own children. You know, sometimes my son would say, Dad, why aren't you a billionaire? 
all your flunkies are billionaire. You know, why do I have to work? You know, I'm Sam Petroda's son. I said, too bad. Okay. <laughs> See, you got to do what you got to do. I will never make a phone call to get my son a job. I will never call anybody for my daughter to have an admission. No way. I just don't do that. Okay. How do we build people with character? We have lost character in India. Everybody is corrupt, and then everybody complains that everybody is corrupt. Maybe you are corrupt yourself. You have no right to complain. Okay. Because everybody wants instant gratification. Nobody wants to put in. Dhirubhai Ambani was a good friend of mine. I used to tell Dhirubhai, Dhirubhai, biggest problem in India, one who has something to give wants to take more. One who wants to give has nothing to give. How do you find people who have something to give, ready to give? That's the kind of narrative I would have. Again, I'm not a social scientist. I'm not an economist, so don't take me too seriously. I'm just an engineer. Thank you, sir. Uh, I hear from you. Please. Uh, I hear from you about decentralized, decentralized. Microphone. Right? Micro, I can't hear you. I hear from you. I hear from you about decentralized. But if you look at technology everywhere, technology is actually centralizing things. Uh, whether you look at, uh, you know, uh, media like Gmail or Facebook or Instagram. Yeah, okay. okay. The basic question is that I'm talking about decentralization, but technology is centralized. Including in India also, if you look at it, everything where it's becoming centralizing, right? So no, not true. And but I, I, I'll finish it, right? When it becomes centralized, uh, the worry of the people, as you talk about in districts and everything, they're all struggling. And the person at the center thinks, you know, I'm doing an amazing job. He doesn't care about what happens in the district because he says, my job is just to build the central technology and do technology. I just, I just observe this, and when you said about decentralization, I think I, I agree with you, but I see the other thing. And you also talk about technology. So I just want to hear you, uh, you, you here. Good question. First of all, on one hand, information is democratized. On the other hand, information is centralized. So you have this contradiction. Information is democratized because you and I can go get whatever information you want. Information is centralized because Google and Facebook has all the information we need. Okay. But those are two or few companies. But with information which is decentralized, I can do a lot for myself. I can find out that there is traffic in Bangalore. I can find out where is the next restaurant in Bangalore. So don't confuse decentralization with centralized information. Of course, I don't like centralized information. That's a separate issue. We can have a separate conversation on that. But information access helps decentralization of activities. Simple example would be, if I have vacancies for five doctors in district, I can find those five doctors in my local area because of information. Now, Google may have information on every doctor centralized. That's Google's problem. So don't confuse that. Okay. Unfortunately, because of centralized information today, best talent in the world is used to increase clicks. What a stupid thing to do. So you have the best brains in the world. What are you trying to do? I'm trying to get more clicks. So I'm going to create fake news so you get more clicks. I'm going to create some other package so you get more clicks. I was at Facebook office last week. I'm on the advisory board of MasterCard. So we had all gone. I thought I'll also go because I'd never seen their office. You go there and you see these thousands of kids. You know. And one group of kids are working on this emoji. Okay, And they are so intense in their work trying to define and change. Is it going to change the world? <laughs> but they think this is a very important task. They are so intense, you know, all hyped, hyped up and, you know, doing great technological contribution, innovation. Come on, give me a break. But that's how world sees. Okay. 
So we have to really understand what is so very fundamental. Fundamental thing in life is really very simple. Health, food, shelter, education, love, work, environment, almost done. If we take care of all of that for millions of people, then in the process some guys will click. Let them click, nah? they'll go buy best of the best. You know, I'm on the board of Institute of Design in Chicago. So best designers who graduate from this school, which is the largest design school in the world, will go work for Cartier, Louis Vuitton. So I told this dean one day, I said, Patrick, have you ever been to India? So Patrick said, no. I said, why don't you go to India and go to Dharavi? Patrick had no idea what Dharavi was. So I kept bugging him and finally he realized that this board of directors is bugging me, so I better go one day. And Patrick is a great human being, great innovator. So Patrick comes to India, goes to Dharavi. And Patrick calls me from Dharavi, he said, Sam, this is a gold mine for PhD thesis. He said, I can get 20 PhDs from this place. He said, there are so many design challenges here. He said, I never thought that there's a design challenge in an environment like this. So he had 10 students from Chicago come here, study Dharavi. How does water get in? What kind of jobs are created? You know, they found out that people have very little space, but they take too much space in storing water. So some guy came up with a plastic bag to hang on the wall, so you get free space. There's a design revolution in Chicago on Dharavi because best brain decided to look at the problem of the poor. And that's the challenge. Sorry for a long answer. So Sam, my name is Cohen Carlos. I am um, the CEO of an AI research lab here in Bangalore. Um, been in touch with you. So one of the questions I have for you is, um, so I see that you're talking in terms of using technology to solve problems. And this is an approach that a lot of economists had advocated at one point. Poor economics, you know, and those books advocated this. But there recently has been a lot of work um, by Kentaro Toyama, for instance. He wrote a book called Geek Heresy, which basically said that none of the technological interventions help poor people. So in a development, developing country like ours, any amount of technology that you throw at things will only exacerbate the difference between the rich and the poor. It will not bring the poor up. It, 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 it serves as a multiplier, not as, an, as a leveler. So that was a charge made by Kentaro, right? He, he now teaches at Yale. Um, so you could look up his book, Geek Heresy. It's a very good book. Um, he worked here in Bangalore for many years, and I, I interacted with him. Excellent piece of work. So one of the things I wanted to ask you is, you know, when you advocate policies based on technology, why don't you measure the outcomes? For instance, for 30 years, you've been working with the government of India. Look at the outcomes. Look at the roads outside. Look at what happens when it rains. You know, you see the outcomes are horrible. Why don't you instead invest in things like education, right? If you look at the um, education budget of the government of India when you were the advisor, it was around seven billion was the federal education budget. The amount they spent buying fighter airplanes from the USA, Israel, and Russia every year was around 20 to 30 billion. Why couldn't you have told them just buy a few, you know, few fewer planes and quadruple the education budget? You know that since the 1960s, the, recommend, the recommended federal education budget is about four times what it is currently, right? It should have been around 25 to 30 billion per, per annum, and they've been keeping it at 7 billion every year. Why did you not change this? You know, why didn't you create some grad schools worthy of the name today, right? The best grad school in India today is ranked 200 in the world, right? So why didn't you do something about this when you had a chance? Okay. I had a friend called Rajini Kothari. I don't know whether you have heard of Rajini Kothari. Rajini Kothari was a great social scientist, head of the uh, Center for Studying Developing Societies in Delhi. Rajini was my childhood friend. And Rajini always used to argue with me, saying, Sam, you are trying to solve problem using technology. I said, that's the only thing I know. Don't expect me to solve a problem with the tool I don't know. You find somebody else to fix potholes nah, on the road. 
don't tell me. I can fix potholes on the road. That's not my expertise. I do drive on that. I also feel same way you feel. I don't like potholes, but I can do it. So don't tell me to do it. I know what I can do and what I can't do. If I advise government that don't have fighter planes, but put more money on education, I know nobody is going to listen. Okay? Because all the army guys have everything locked up. So why waste my time? Okay, I'm not an idiot. I may look like one. Okay. So I know what I can do and what I can't do. When I became chairman of Knowledge Commission, I was the guy who increased education budget four times along with my colleagues. Okay. But I never told that to anybody. A lot of people say you guys did some great work during NDA, but you never advertised. Uh, UPA, but you never advertised. I said, look, my job was to do my work, not go on toot my horn. I don't do that. I don't have to tell people what I did. I'm not here for popularity contest. I don't need a vote. Okay? I have to do my work. Even my own family does not know what I do. You'll be surprised. They have no clue as to I was chairman of Innovation Council, I was chairman of this, I did report on the railway reforms, I have nothing to do with it. But I do it. So, each one of us will have to decide what I can do and what I can't do. So, don't expect me to solve all the problems. I am humanly not capable. I am not knowledgeable. I am not equipped. So, find a civil engineer, bug him to fix potholes. Find an army guy, tell him to convince army guy to spend less on fighter jets. We specialize in identifying problems. And I tell people in India, you do not need talent to identify problems in India. You walk on the street, stand there for 10 minutes, you can list all India's problems. You also don't need talent to come up with solutions. But I said earlier, you need young people who have courage to go do it against all the odds. Lot of my friends from America want to come and help. And they are experts and they are great. Immediately they'll say, what will be my designation? You have no designation. Okay? You know, Jaduwala, go get it done. No, I can't do that. You know, will I get a car? Will I get a bungalow? What will be my title? You are finished. You can make a contribution. Okay? You may be a great guy. You may have a lot of feelings for India. Are you really interested in solving a problem? Against all the odds, people will hate you. People will frustrate you. People will abuse you. You have to just love them. Okay? And someday something might happen. It may not happen all the time. But keep doing it. There's a broader issue as well. Um, one of the things I found, I used to teach occasionally, give guest lectures in universities, and I'd ask the students, what, what, what do you want? And they say, I want to make $100,000 a year. And you go to Silicon Valley and you say, what do you want? It's, I want to be a CEO. And too many people are using technology as, as a, a thing in, an, in and of itself. And one of the most instructive uses of technology I saw was a year ago, and I went to a place called Barefoot College, a guy named Bunker Roy, who is finding technology that, that gives light in villages that don't have electricity or makes water safer, because people haven't done that. And I think a lot of it is applying that technology as a human being to solve real problems instead of making money or making big corporations. And so one of the problems in geek heresy is people are focused on themselves instead of making their society better. But technology ultimate does percolate down. So you are wrong in saying technology don't help poor. Take telephone. But it would help poor more if more of us were working years ago, on that. nobody had thought that telephone would be useful to driver, to cook, to tribal people and all that. It's a technology. Television is technology. Improving quality of food is technology. Okay. 
So technology does percolate down. It doesn't percolate as fast as you and I would like. And that's our frustration. But it's good to have that frustration. Okay? If that problem is solved, we won't have anything to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah go, go. Uh, hey, Carl, this question's for you. Uh, I think you very rightly said uh, the way to tackle fake news is by giving people access to knowledge, right? And I think that's absolutely correct, especially in India, we now see with the UP elections or in the US, uh, almost a weaponization of social media, a weaponization of ways that we always thought access to information would be a good thing. And in the intermediate stage we are at, uh, oh, okay, thank you. Uh, at the intermediate stage we are at, we are struggling with that. How do you propose we tackle fake news by giving access to information, right? Access to knowledge. Like, like the, I, I'm pretty sure you know about this, but the way fake news is percolated, in India at least, is that different political parties would hire like dozens of like party vendors and they would sit on the computer and write scripts and troll. Or sit on the computer and write scripts and like do stuff, right? Or like WhatsApp forwards and stuff like that. Do we create a corollary of that but for like real information where we like challenge trolling by trolling or like challenge WhatsApp forwards by sending real WhatsApp forwards? Like how do we use the same medias that we have today to give access to actual knowledge? Like so, you say. so I think here is the answer to fake news. It's tempting to say we need to stop fake news. We need Twitter to censor the fake news and throw away all the Nazis. But the problem is how do you know, you know what's bad? Because sometimes you look at something and you say this is bad and it turns out it isn't. Um, I think the answer to fake news is good news. And I think when you go to the store and you buy your daily newspaper, you have a choice. You know, do you buy the Hindu? Do you buy the Hindustan Times? Uh, you buy the newspaper that you believe in. And I think the answer to fake news is two things. One is better good news. And then a way when you're looking at something, you know how when you're on Google and you're about to go to a bad site and it says, warning, warning, this might be a phishing site. Um, I think a plugin that, you know, you can choose which of the plugins, but when you're looking at something, maybe there's a little ding, ding, ding that goes off saying, you know, 10 people have said this is, this is total nonsense here. And you can judge for yourself, but, you know, here's an alarm. Um, if journalism students, for example, spent their time looking around the net and logging their opinions of what they think is right and what is not, you know, maybe they're wrong, and I have access to that database, when I'm looking at a site, maybe I can get a clue as to what I'm looking at, and if I'm educated, maybe I look at that and say, oh, that's just total nonsense. But you know, it, um, it is more than fake news. Yeah. Let me give you an example. You know, there is a court case in India on National Herald. Okay where I am one of the accused by uh, Subramanian Swami. And I have no problem going public on these kinds of things. So first of all, it's a fake case. There is nothing in it. It's all bogus. But people in India believe that we all have done something wrong. Because the news was that there is 1200 crore worth of land we have gathered. Come on, give me a break. Okay. So what he does, is there is a summon on me that has to be served. So summon regularly gets served through foreign office because I am in Chicago. So you go to foreign office, foreign office will tell US government, US government will inform the ambassador, ambassador will come and write to me or whatever. So Subramaniam Swami is of the world, whosoever did it, sends a guy from India to my home in Chicago. It is okay. And some fake American white guy dressed up as a security come to my door. Fortunately, that day I am not home and my wife is also not home. So they hang something on my door, take a picture and all over the Twitter, Petroda is absconding. The funny thing. So I get calls from my friends saying, what is this Petroda is absconding with a picture of my house? It is, this is not a fake news. So I said, look, just ignore it. You know, you laugh at it. Okay, how could I be excounting from my own house where I have lived for 53 years? But the little guy who doesn't know anything, ah, Pitoda is like that. He always abscounds. You know, he's basically corrupt because he has all Congress party money. He was friend of Rajiv Gandhi. They have 17,000 crores. Bogus goes on. Everybody then starts 
rumor. What can you do? Because everybody is basically ignorant. Nobody wants to check facts. Because it's work. Checking facts is work. Nobody wants extra work, na? You know, gossip is very interesting. It just flies, you know. But that's the world we live in. But I think over a period of time, this is going to change. We have started a non-profit organization in Paris, where I'm one of the founding directors, called AAID, where about 20 of us are fighting this whole idea of fake news. It's a big organization now. We have a major meeting coming up in Hague. You know, so we do a lot of these interesting things. Some work, some don't work. You know. Do we have time? I have at least six more questions. Okay. Yeah, no, we'll I think be, we're we'll fine. be brief in answering now. Yes. I think we need better technology Hello? for <laughs> microphone. There you go. You got to put the mic right up to your mouth. Eat it. Um, so yes, so this is a question for both of you. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, so I teach a discipline called digital humanities, um, where basically the heart of what we do is talk about how technology is not neutral and how it is a top-down, um, hegemonic, centralized um, kind, of, kind of part of our culture that we are not looking or examining the values behind. And I find in India, a lot of the rhetoric around, say, things like Make in India or Digital India are this kind of very techno-utopian, techno-deterministic way of looking at um, the way technology can help us. So how do you think it would be possible to um, teach the values behind technology in places like engineering colleges, for example, where there is, as you're saying, the best brains being kind of deviated towards places like Google, and to get them to understand the kind of history of how technology has authority baked into it, um, so, yes, I'd be really interested to hear any responses you have. I believe that code is law, and when I teach engineering students, I want them to read the request for comments and understand how the Internet works. And if you look at the Internet, it's the end-to-end -end principle. There's nothing in the middle, and that's why we started the Internet, because the telecommunications companies were in the middle and they were screwing up. And so the people like Vince Cerf and David Clark and all those put together this technology that went over the, the, the telephone network and turned it into a dumb network. Um, so it is not inevitable that technology is top down. And you have to teach the engineers that, that we can have that decentralized world. We can have open operating systems instead of iOS on your, your iPhone that, that nobody can see the source code. And, and begin using those technologies whenever you can and designing those and a lot of that is folks like you working in the open source world because a lot of what we're trying to do is is make that thing not a top-down thing something that empowers people I used to have a poster on my wall that said freedom of the press belongs to those who own one when I started internet talk radio I had that poster up on my wall and I was able to start a radio station with one computer and at the time, it cost millions of dollars to start a radio station. So I, I, I think we can change that, and part of it is, is up to the engineering schools to educate their students that, that it doesn't have to be, go get a job and work for Facebook. There are other things you can do with, with your life. Same thing with civil engineers. But you I don't have to build skyscrapers. You can build homes for the poor. But at the end of the day, there are a few fundamental issues that you need to really learn discipline, analysis, creativity, respect for other ideas, ethics, openness, simplicity. These are all Gandhian ideas. Just learn 10 things to do in life. Everything else will follow. Truth is a very simple idea. Trust is a very simple idea. How many people trust each other? What does trust mean? But we have never taught these things. And we get caught in this very complex ecosystem and we are searching for simplicity. Can't find it. 
Okay, short questions and short answers, okay? Uh, okay, <laughs> I'll try to keep it short. So given that you have been working on copyright for so long and been doing all these, let's say, gorilla interventions like this, uh, Digital Library of India, uh, but the copyright regime in general has been turning into one direction, like the, the term keeps increasing. Uh, do you see any, any ways of basically, or any hopes of uh, uh, getting it back, uh, the copyright term shortening back, what kind of interventions can be made uh, for that? Is there any cracks in that armor of like, so now it's 70 years. Uh, is there any, uh, with TPP it will become uh, lifeless 70 years. Is there any hope of getting it back to 50, 40, 30? I believe copyright reform is something that must happen. Uh, copyright has gone way. Remember, copyright is not there to give you a living as a writer. Copyright is there to pr provide an incentive to create knowledge for people. And as part of that bargain, you get limited rights. And we've, we've turned that into this infinite copyright term. Copyright reform is something that, that people all over the world have been working on. We haven't been very lucky so far, uh, but I think as people understand the importance of information, which is the world we live in, they're going to realize that information must be available to a much broader swath of people. And when you do that, the world changes. I learned that when I put government databases online, right? You know, when, when the patent database was a private thing, it was only patent lawyers that, that used it because it was expensive. I put it online and millions and millions of engineers started, you know, reading the patent database in order to understand what's there. So that was a long answer. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm taking a picture. Okay, next question. I got a next question for both of you. Uh, so when we say that we need to follow Gandhi and his ideology, it's very hard. I mean, uh, you can follow Gandhi in certain ways for good, but not everywhere. And when we had this discussion at the Gandhi Ashram, we were discussing how to bring Gandhi onto the internet, digital democracy, Gandhi and democracy onto the internet. I still couldn't find an answer. Did you find something? How could we uh, propagate it further? I missed the question. What is the answer you are finding? Yeah, you how do we spread Gandhian philosophy on the internet? Use Gandhi better on the internet? Oh, I think it's pretty straightforward. Okay. Spread truth. Trust people. Be open. Love everybody. That's Gandhian. And for you to follow Gandhi, you don't have to follow everything. Let me give you one example. In 89, I was to give a convocation speech at Calcutta IIM. So I go to give a speech and I never prepare my speech. I just say whatever I feel like. So but you have to have a written speech. You know, I'm giving a convocation speech day after tomorrow in Ahmedabad. I don't have a written speech. So I go there and I'm in my mood and something clicked on Gandhi. So I said, look, you don't have to follow Gandhi everywhere. You could wear jeans, drink scotch and still be Gandhian. Next day, headline in the paper, Petrona said, Gandhi drank scotch and wore jeans. <laughs> That's okay. You know, so you have to see it in that light. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, okay, I have a very quick and short question. Given that um, the next billion users of the internet in India are going to come from mobile, uh, how do you see the open data project that you're in engaged in? Like, how do you make sure that you'll reach the next billion users on mobile who are using something between a smart and a feature phone? Uh, I mean, what, whatever you're doing will have, of course, huge impact. And I think it will. It may not reach if you know if, if we limit ourselves to just the desktop or the even fancy uh, smartphone. So, how do you? Uh, I mean, how are you think? Uh, how are you thinking about reaching the next billion users on the smart feature phones? So you're saying those next billion users aren't going to be using smartphones. They're going to be using other. No, phones. Uh, I'm, I'm going. To, they're going to be introduced to the internet on the smart feature phones, and yeah. when they eventually very, get very to. Very simple answer to that. Yeah. Next billion users will have a smaller screen. Exactly. That, that's, that's exactly. It, none. 
Uh, so so how able to do everything yeah. that you do today, but it will be on this screen. Exactly. So which is why I'm thinking how to get that particular information which So every you have. information you have today will have to be available on this. I, I think a lot of people have been working on that problem. I know the folks at Mozilla, for example, have shifted much of their focus to working in a phone world. I know the Facebook guys, the Google guys, they all work on that. Um, I think we're beginning to understand how to go from the big screen to the smaller portable screen. Now the question is, is it going to be a closed operating system? Will you be able to install your own applications on there? Will you be able to put your own data? You know, it's getting harder and harder to take your own data and put it on your iPhone so that you can access it, you know, if it doesn't fit within the official paradigms that they give you. So that's well, the big challenge. Yes, there is a lot of work going on today. There is a chipset which will give you projection on cell phone. Okay. I have one prototype where if you're a small screen and you are five friends and you want to see something, you just project on wall wherever you are and there'll be big screen. You know, and that's the answer. Hi, out here in the back. Um, so I want to pick up on the fake news discussion that was going on a few questions ago. So, you know, Facebook has come under scrutiny in the US because of their role in the elections over there. And fake news on Facebook is something that was clearly an outcome of the algorithmic bias. You know, it was something that the algorithm selected for and amplified. Uh, fake news in India, on the other hand, happens on WhatsApp. The social network is different. It is not an algorithmic propagation. It is a user propagation. But and yet, Facebook. and yet Facebook. it's the same company. It's Facebook. But I see nobody holding them to account, saying that they control the platform, they have the ability to do something about it, and they don't even care. It's only in the US that after severe criticism, because you got that chap over there, you know, as an outcome of Facebook, um, that there is some talk of Facebook needing to do better. Yeah, but what it makes What happens in India? I mean, the thing is, uh, so the question is, don't we have a responsibility to speak up more about Facebook's responsibility to fix their fake news problem in India on WhatsApp? What makes you think Facebook cares in the United States as opposed to simply fielding a couple of senators' questions? Well, <laughs> They will be forced to, you know, for whatever, to the extent that at least they're under public scrutiny. Out here, nobody even thinks of Facebook as being the responsible party. No, but you should speak. Of course. I should speak. We all should speak. That's not going to change Facebook, I can tell you that. Yeah, it just... Okay. So, my but concern we is that our job. we're not speaking, you know, that's what I'm worried about. Uh, I think... Some of, some of these companies pay experts. Hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars to generate fake news. I'm telling, I know it. And not only that, companies okay. like Facebook, um, I would say on occasion encourage that practice. I, I'm not saying they're evil, um, no. but you know what their metric is? Revenue. Yes. That's what they care about. Exactly. That, that's the only thing that's important. Um, and I think it's important that these companies maybe face up to their social responsibilities, that the users demand that, and if they don't get it from Facebook, you know, we should start looking at other platforms. A lot of these platforms that looked great, like MySpace, they're gone, right? Facebook isn't necessarily going to last. Uber may not make it, right? Um, they seem to have totally blown it. So these big monoliths may not last that long, and they won't last, if we don't let them, if we don't like the way they behave, we need to find another platform yeah, to work on. But the shame is that we have not been able to develop our own local platform. Nobody talks about that. Yeah, but that, that's India much harder does problem. Not, India does not have our own operating system. India does not have any social network which is unique to India. Look what Chinese did. No matter how you look at Chinese. They got all their stuff. We could have done it. Well, okay. We do have a hike messenger that nobody uses. Say it again. Hike. <laughs> hike. Oh, oh. It's a WhatsApp of India. Yes. So yeah. So so the the thing that you know I want to get to is users leaving WhatsApp because of fake news sounds like an extremely unlikely proposition as far as my reading of this room goes. You know, we all know that WhatsApp is a problem because of the fake news that we keep getting on family WhatsApp groups. But the solution isn't to leave WhatsApp because we will leave it, but our family won't. And they will continue to propagate fake news. Oh, look, and you can't delete it right now, okay? But yeah. we can educate ourselves and we can look for the alternative. Um, I, I used to use a variety of platforms and I started to like Twitter. And I've used it oh, for probably the last eight years. 
I'm getting a little tired of it. Um, and I'm looking around for alternatives. I, you can't solve these problems overnight. You see, um, I have been promoting also, this idea. This is, this is, I, this is where I want to get to the actual question. Before I forget. Yeah. You know, at my age, yeah. you tend to forget a little quickly. I have been promoting this idea here. I had spoken on it. Is we should split internet into two. One, someone who is willing to identify himself. And two, someone who is going to hide behind. All the fake news comes from people who want to hide. Fake news don't come from people who are wide open, saying, I am Sam Petroda and I am promoting fake news. So if I see when internet protocol was written, we didn't have cell phones. So internet protocol was written, written for a fixed line. Yeah. Internet protocol evolved and cell phone evolved faster. So I had a conversation with Wint Surf. Wint is a good friend. Saying, Wint, you guys didn't think of mobile telephony at that time. If you had thought of mobile telephony, then protocol would have been written differently. So wherever you go, it will follow. Then you'll identify me. See, he wants authentication. He wants reliable. Uh, yes. Now, he, he wants to allow. Do you people, endorse the position? But but he wants the ability to say this is a real person, and I know it's a real person, and therefore that person can get to the banking account, and I know this person did that. Security and authentication have always been the holy grail of the internet, and we've hey, always like failed. People. We've always failed. Um, but it's something we need to work on. Um, so there there are solutions there. But again, it comes down to us demanding a new way of doing things. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> what was that? What was Listen, that? I missed it. Aadhaar. <laughs> Should you, you require Aadhaar to use the internet? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I want to ask if you endorse okay. this position. That is authentication mandatory for someone using the internet. Do you endorse that position? That you should be authenticated to use the internet and publish. That is the one solution. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So that I know that you are a real person. I you know, know that whatever you say, you will own up to it. You may say something wrong and you will be sorry for it. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. And so um, would this solve fake news given that you have Donald Trump putting out fake news regularly? The completely under a verified identity. Look, there are people paid in political system. I know of rooms, 200 people who just do nothing but spread fake news. Yeah. Okay, look, that's, okay. A, that's a really hard problem, and it's an important problem, and you raise a good question, but I, I don't know, know the answer answers. Also. I don't know the answers, you but, also but I know, know. we got to work on it. So, more hi. questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah, hi. So, provided the premise is a little bit off the radar from what the discussion has been going on, provided the premises of India and the thoughts of decentralization and the politics in this decentralization, what are your comments on that? How would that work? in a decentralized atmosphere, the politics, how would it, I have a very weird fear that it would again hamper it. So what are your comments on that? See, it depends on what you call decentralization in politics. To me, decentralization in politics imply elected officer at not just panchayat, but at district. Elected officer in the city and given power to them. Today, mayor has no power. District collector has all the power. There is no selected of, elected officer. So to me, that is decentralized politics. Whether at this higher level, group of people elect this leader or that leader will take little more time in India. But that leader should be also elected. Today, none of the parties have democracy. None. OK? I don't know how they become leader. They just become leader. And they are high command. And they are all over. I don't understand this. Okay? But they have captured. So democracy has been hijacked everywhere. What is happening in the US? Democracy has been hijacked. And when they hijacked it, they stole your government. You own your government. It's a democracy. And but part of the problem is that we, we haven't taken that back. But there's a very interesting difference. In the US, when democracy gets hijacked, institutions don't get hijacked. In India, when democracy gets hijacked, institutions also get hijacked. Well, our entire federal government just got hijacked. <laughs> Say <that> again? <laughs> the entire federal government got hijacked. Yeah. Okay. But still, <laughs> but still American institutions are pretty strong. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. 
I think, you know, one of the questions is on ethics. Someone comes and does a public service, like you did a public service. Uh, you eat talk the microphone. Eat you it. Eat it. Eat it. Yeah. Okay. You talked about public service. You talked about Subhanayam Swami. You talked about openness, right? Today, I also find a lot of people coming out into the public service. I also hear how there's a conflict of interest in what they are doing. Do you have a guidance to them, guidance to people? Yeah? When, when you say youngsters, they see two type of people. One is someone like Sam Petroda who came sometime back, provided C dot. I had a cousin work there in the early times when you said 28. I, I, I'm 40, so I can, I can associate saying that, yes, that was true. But at the same time, today, what people are seeing is, hey, someone is coming to the open source, not free, free software, open source, doing something, selling the whole thing across to someone, making money, right? So using others' thing. For example, I had a question to you. You build the whole great internet archive. It looks awesome on one side, but there's a fear coming in the mind. Hey, if with a lot of hits and clicks, will you sell it to Google? Because Google will find the indexing to be very good, and Facebook and Google would both compete, and Microsoft, you know, Gates would also compete with the same, right? How are we going to have a ethics? And, you know, when we talk about Gandhi, the ethics and everything comes into picture too. So, you know, I would like your uh, views on it. Apologies if it was a wrong question in this audience. So first of all, what he is doing is non-profit. So he can't sell his website to Google. Okay, so that's, and even if he sells, he won't get a dime. Not only that, you know, we have a corporate okay. policy. We don't own intellectual property. We have none. Okay. Okay, that's, I want to clarify that first. Otherwise, he won't be my friend. Okay. Two, when I came to India, I had to make a choice. Do I want to build a business or I want to lose my shirt and make a contribution? That choice was mine. I decided I'm never going to make a dime in India. No business, no salary, no bank account, no ownership of Dhirubhai Ambani stock or any stock, nothing. Okay? I have no bank account. I don't own anything, even today. Not only in India, even in US. Okay? Because I don't need anything. My wife buys my stuff. If she says, your socks are fata hua, she'll buy new socks, I wear new socks. Other, I don't care. I look weird anyway, so it's not going to make any difference. Okay? So you have to make that personal decision. Somebody might say, I will get a government job and I'll make a lot of money. That's a personal decision. You and I can't stop that. Okay? So ethics is something very personal. Ethics cannot be institutionalized. When some news reporter asked me, he says, what's your view on corruption? I said, I have no views on corruption. But I can tell you one thing. I am not corrupt. 100% guaranteed. But I can't say the same thing about my wife. And my wife went crazy. She said, how dare you say this on television? I said, it is true. I don't know. You could be corrupt. I have no idea. I can only take responsibility to myself. He may have bribed somebody for something. How do I know? I've never asked her. Ethics is very personal. Each one of us will have to decide that I'm ethical. Don't advise anybody on being ethical. It doesn't work. Okay? So just keep quiet and enjoy and love them. That's all. And we learn ethics. Right? That, that doesn't just rain down from the sky. That's education. We teach ourselves ethics. Our parents teach it. The church teach it, it teaches that. Uh, but again, that's knowledge and education. We, we have to instill those values in ourselves, in our rulers, and in our children. And I think that's how you solve those problems. Okay. Are we all, one more question. One more. Last question. Yeah, hi. Um, our general understanding so far has been that technology and data are agnostic, that they have no biases and they do not have prejudices. However, isn't it a problem with artificial intelligence and machine learning that human biases and prejudices are eventually going to be implemented into the AI that we create? Because eventually the artificial intelligence is only going to be as good as the data that we provide it with. Also, isn't this problem exacerbated because the AI often functions as a black box wherein you can't see what's happening inside, and all you can eventually see is what's coming out of it. Now, when you look at the implications of this, which is, say, governments making decisions or even courts using it in sentencing, which has happened in Wisconsin, we are faced with a grave problem. How do you propose we solve this? Technology is like a knife. You can cut your vegetables, and you can kill somebody. You take a pick. Do you want a knife, or you don't want a knife? We have selected to have a knife. 
technology is exactly in the same category. There is good use, there is bad use. Some will use it properly, some will use it improperly. But technology is a great equalizer. I used to say, and I still say once in a while, that technology is a greatest social leveler, second only to death. It can equalize two human beings. If you have a smartphone, I have a smartphone, you can do the same thing I can do. Okay? Then it doesn't matter. You have access to phone, I have access to phone, we are equal. So technology has some good parts and also has some bad parts. You know, if somebody is watching pornography on cell phone all day, what can I do? More power to him? I don't care. So, so let, let me conclude with that black box thing because I think that's important. Robots are black boxes. AI is a black box. iOS is a black box. I think one of the important things is we need to know how our infrastructure works. We need to know how the things that are important in our life work. Um, I believe, I, I was a big fan, and I still am, of Hind Swaraj, but I believe in this day and age, the big challenge is code Swaraj. And I think if we're worried about an AI bot making decisions in a court that are bad, we need to demand that the source code be open. Just like when you have security modules, we need to see the source code to see what's going on. Is there a backdoor in my OS, right? Is my encryption flawed? And so part of it is demanding that we are able to know the rules of the infrastructures and the laws, because code is law that governs our life. Okay, okay thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, Numa. And thank you, Hasby. We really appreciate it. Thanks for coming yeah. on Sunday. Really appreciate it.